that is the seminar session about, the beginnings of the demo scene trace back to the 60s or even earlier. In the 60s were the advent of the computer graphics. The first computers with uh, graphical capabilities appeared. The first one was built uh, by the US Air Force. Uh, it was a radar uh, connected to a computer uh, because the researchers found that a computer can uh, plot the the cores and the speed of incoming aircraft much faster than analog devices. So the first computer, graphical computer, was a radar called Whirlwind. It was a very successful uh, construction. Uh, as I recall, it was uh, completed in 52, and uh, it was used till 82 or something like that. It was a very good uh, computer. But the first real computer, real graphical computer, was the uh, DAC-1, the first 3D graphics computer. A design augmented by computers. Uh, it was a development of IBM and General Motors in 59. It was first presented in 64 on the Joint Computer Conference in Chicago. Uh, this was the first uh, computer that was capable of 3D graphics, vector graphics. Uh, it was still using a vector monitor. You know, vector monitors were before raster monitors. Uh, they were drawing, uh, the electron beam was drawing lines on the screen and not dots like uh, today's monitors. Uh, later, they figured that raster monitors are much better and uh, they are more flexible than vector monitors, so they dropped the idea of vector. Uh, the first raster, terminal, uh, raster uh, display was in the IBM uh, 2250 terminal in 1965. So, the beginnings of the graphics, this was the first graphical computers, and the first usage of 3D vector uh, also it was in the, in the early 60s. Uh, yes, 3D vector graphics was developing fast. First, they figured how to remove the edges of a 3D object that is not visible for the viewer. That was the invention of uh, field vector and later flat shading. You know what is flat shading? You have an object that's built up of polygons, and the faces that are facing towards a light source uh, are brighter. They're painted with a brighter color. Now, this was not uh, really lifelike. Uh, it was still very angular. So there was a, a French uh, mathematician who was working at the University of the Utah, and he was called Henri Gros. He invented the so-called Gros shading in 1971. It was, uh, basically, it was a very simple method. All coders can explain it. Uh, basically, it's about interpolating the color difference between the different uh, uh, surfaces of the 3D object. Uh, the result was a smooth uh, shaded uh, surface, what you can see in demos nowadays. Uh, the only setback was that the, the faces on the edge cannot be shaded because they don't have neighbors, so you don't, can't do this interpolation. And uh, there is also a second glitch of this method. Sometimes when an ob object is rotating, sometimes uh, some faces get uh, invisible and you see the faces on the backside, which, which are normally not visible. That's a bug. Uh, and then came Bui Tuong Phong. Uh, he was a, a Vietnamese mathematician. He came in 1974, and uh, he published a paper titled Illumination for Computer Generated Pictures, and that was uh, a better version from Guru's shading, and that's called the Phong shading. Uh, well, that was a drawback for the Phong shading because it required much more uh, computing power than Guru shading, so hence uh, both shading methods are still used nowadays. And there are some more developments on, on the field of shading, as you will soon see. But there was another field of computer graphics that was rapidly advancing in the 60s, and there was the fractals. The fractals were invented by a guy called Benoit B. Mandelbrot, working for IBM. He had a book titled uh, The Fractal Geometry of Nature in 1978. It was the first book about fractals, about how to generate a fractal. You know, it's a, fractals are uh, computer-generated uh, uh, images based on uh, iterations with uh, complex numbers. Well, it's uh, explained in detail in the book, but the result, as you perhaps know, one of the results is the so-called Mandelbrot fractal and the uh, Julia fractal and all kinds of fractals, and most importantly, landscapes, generated landscapes. You know, a computer can be used with a fractal algorithm, uh, algorithm to generate a uh, landscape like hills and valleys and stuff and uh, paint them accordingly to uh, uh, different points height. Uh, later, as we will see, it, uh, in the film industry and also in demos, they will make good use uh, to this uh, invention. 
Texture mapping has also appeared in the 60s. It was an invention of uh, Edwin Ketmol. It was part of his uh, uh, PhD paper at Thesis. In 1974, he invented texture mapping and z-buffering. You know texture mapping, what is it? Uh, you have an object and you wrap it in a bitmap. So it is like, a, like if it had a painted surface, something like that. Z-buffering was an important new method because it enabled uh, programmers to, in, uh, to intersect objects on the street, uh, screen. Because if two objects, two virtual objects, collide in the virtual space, uh, one of them will either not be uh, drawn on the screen anymore or just uh, the polygon that is intersecting with the other object will not be drawn. So there will be a hole on the object. Z-buffer was a mathematical uh, algorithm that enabled them to uh, intersect uh, different objects. Uh, and one more thing, the guy you see on the screen is called Ivan Sutherland. He was a, a student of the MIT in the 60s. And this picture was taken in 1961 when he demonstrated the usage of the first graphical program ever, 2D graphics program. It was called Sketchpad. And what he has in his hand is the first light pen. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, he had the idea of drawing on the screen with a special pen. And he invented the function that are still used in graphical programs nowadays, like for example, rectangle drawing. You know, when you're drawing a rectangle, you don't draw it pixel by pixel, but you just select uh, the upper left and the lower right corner and the computer will do the rest. Well, that was his invention. All the basic functions of graphical programs uh, trace back to this one. So let's go on. Industrial design programs, uh, Industrial design programs uh, were very advanced already at the beginning of the 70s. They were using all kinds of shadings and uh, texture mapping and stuff. So we can uh, say that uh, the CAD industry has started back then. And the dawn of computer entertainment came when the funny people met the computer graphics. In the 70s, there was the first games and home computers. You remember this? Yeah, it's Pong. The first arcade machines and the first Space War was a game written by uh, Steve Russell, nicknamed Slug. And uh, it was a very simple game. Maybe you know it. Space War is a, a game when you have a star in the middle of the screen. Its gravity is attracting everything. And you and your opponent are both flying uh, star, star uh, ships and trying to shoot at each other. But the missiles are uh, also... Uh, uh, also deflected by the uh, gravity of the star and uh, you have to move away from the star so you don't crash into it and stuff and uh, meanwhile avoid uh, enemy missiles. Uh, this game was later adapted to uh, an arcade machine by Nolan Bushnell who was the later, uh, he was the founder of Atari. Well, Space War was not uh, really the big hit but his second game, Pong, was and that was where the story of Atari started when they built the first uh, Pong arcade machines, placed them in bars and uh, Later, they made the first real uh, home consoles. Okay, it was not the first because there was the Magnavox Odyssey well before the Atari VCS, what you can see on the screen. Uh, that was the first console you can connect to a TV and play games. But the first real console, modern console, was the Atari video computer system in 1977. It was designed by a guy called Jay Miner. You know him, he was also the designer of the Amiga. Uh, if we go on, the next step of home computer development were the real home computers. You know, people uh, quickly get bored of just playing with the computer they have, and they wanted to write programs on their own. And then came Apple and released the Apple II home computer, as you see, in 1977, just in the same year as the Atari VCS came out. Now, this was already space age back then. Uh, releasing the Apple II was like if uh, today someone would have released a 1024-bit uh, uh, computer, uh, with the capability of a Hollywood render farm and call it a game machine. Well, this was Apple II. It had graphics, it had music, however very primitive, uh, but it was a real computer and it spread very fast, especially in the United States. And here was the birth of the scene when the mass demand for this computer swoke and the first online communities were born because you could buy a, a modem for your Apple II and connect it to BBSs. You know, the first BBSs appeared. Uh, Actually, with this, we have to go back to the Atari VCS again, 
because in 1977 there was a little company called GameLine which had an idea of making a special module for the Atari VCS. It was uh, plugged into the cartridge port, whereas it was the only port. It was actually a modem with a built-in software that was built in an app ROM. And uh, you could call an online service with it and download games to Atari VCS. These games were just like four kilobytes or eight kilobytes big, so it uh, didn't take long. But this was the world's first online service. And uh, some years later, this game line service grew that big. Uh, later, it was called America Online, uh, even till today. So the first online communities <coughs> were built by the Apple II seniors in America. So funnily enough, the scene, as we know it, was born in America, where there is no scene nowadays. Well, practically, there is none. And uh, on a computer, uh, which nowadays has a very weak scene, you know, the Mac scene and the Apple scene, whatever. Uh, this was the first time when uh, crackers appeared. You know, there were games for this uh, Apple uh, machines, and people started copying it, and the game companies invented the copy protections. And this was the first time when uh, crackers uh, tried to remove these copy protections. Uh, one of the general methods was to use disk formats that are non-standard disk formats that are unreadable for normal copying programs. And uh, crackers made some special utilities called muffins that enabled users to copy this uh, uh, copy-protected software. And this was also the first time uh, when this, uh, uh, people uh, used uh, nicknames and uh, they got in groups. The first known groups were all American from the Queenstown uh, area of New York, New York City. The first groups were Apple Mafia, Dirty Dozen, The Warlords, and some more. They were all founded around 1979 uh, and uh, 1980. The first uh, pirate BBSs has appeared at the same time. Uh, one of them were the Sherwood Forest, another bloody BBS, Thieves Underground, and Rat's Nest. These were all Apple II boards. Besides of copied software, they had some other stuff to download from normal users. Uh, you know, usually they were disguised as normal, uh, regular legal BBSCs, and only the elite know that there are uh, download zones uh, full with wares. And uh, there were text files to download for most of the users. Well, most of them were just uh, some stuff interesting to read. There were some uh, novels and uh, poems and uh, food receipts, but there were uh, other nasty things like the anarchist cookbook, if you remember that, or I guess you know it, and uh, the terrorist handbook. They were all originated from this time. And these were guys called files with PH. And uh, this is why we have to stop again, because this was the first time when uh, nowadays elite slang was used, like words like uh, Vores, Hacker, and so. And uh, the Apple seniors were the first uh, to, uh, the, uh, to change these words, change letters in the words like we do uh, nowadays. Like, wares can be written. It, it would be written uh, normally with S, Vores. But uh, they replaced the S with a Z. It was because they, uh, they suspected the FBI stepping their BBS lines. And uh, they replaced the letters because they, they supposed that the uh, FBI is using computers to detect uh, given words like words, like hacker, cracker, whatever. So they replaced characters, uh, and the uh, computer will not spot these uh, altered words. And the second thing, uh, perhaps you know that all groups, even nowadays, usually have a three-letter mnemonic. Well, this is because the contemporary arcade machines had uh, three letters for the high score table to enter. That's why we have three letter mnemonics even today. Okay, let's go on. The Commodore 64 was the first computer that had a real scene, but uh, where is it originated from? This uh, not so cute, but certainly very smart gentleman you see here. He's called Jack Tramiel, or Idek Tramielski in his original name, because uh, he was a Polish Jew. He, he survived Auschwitz. He was in a concentration camp. And he was released without any, uh, any school or something like that at age 17. He went to America, where he joined the army. There he learned how to repair typewriters. And when he left the army in the early 50s, uh, he opened a little workshop in Bronx, New York. And there he repaired typewriters. Well, he was a so good businessman that in two uh, years, he had a typewriter assembly uh, factory in Canada. And in a few years, uh, he founded a company called Commodore International. Well, he called it Commodore because he wanted some, uh, some military name. He wanted to call it, first he wanted to call it General and later Admiral, but uh, all these names were taken. So he chose Commodore. That's why it was called. So there were a few years, uh, a few years passed, uh, till they started to make their own computers. Where it not came out of no nothing, 
because uh, first they were making uh, uh, calculators, mechanical calculators, then uh, electric, electronic calculators, and finally they acquired a company called Metaloxid Semiconductor that was MOS, and they had a very smart engineer called Chuck Paddle. He was working on a new version of an old Motorola processor, and the result was the 6502, the famous uh, processor that was later used in many computers. Well, when Chuck Pedal completed uh, this chip, he had the idea to build a computer with it. And he approached Jack Tremiel with the idea, but he was going to some meeting, he was uh, in a hurry, and Chuck Pedal was literally running after him on the corridor and telling that, you know, Jack, we could build this computer uh, with these capabilities and stuff. And Jack didn't say, he just said, build it. And uh, this little sentence started the career of Commodore as a computer company. The result, what you see on the screen, was the PET series, a series of business computers. Well, it, it uh, wasn't a very good computer, even in its time, but it was a forerunner of much better ones. Uh, later, Jack Tramiel had the idea of uh, building computers for the masses, and they had a slogan, computers for the masses, not the classes. Uh, well, a thing to know, uh, Commodore never had a marketing uh, uh, section. Uh, all the marketing was done solely by Jack Tramiel. He invented all the logos, all the slogans and everything, and it, it worked very good. Uh, as soon as they had a marketing section, Commodore went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, really. So, uh, it was the pet series, and they had an idea. Later, they made a WIC-20. It was the first home computer. It was uh, not a very strong computer. I guess you know it all, and it doesn't need an introduction. It wasn't a very good computer, but it was, uh, it was a forerunner of a much better one, as you know, the Commodore 64. But there was another plan, the Super Pet. The Super Pet series was supposed to be uh, an advanced PET series, and uh, they designed two models, the PET P, Super PET P, and the Super PET B, business and private. Private was supposed to be a home computer, but this project was running very slow, and the Commodore 64 was finished earlier. And that's why we nowadays have the Commodore 64 and not something called Super PET. It was only a matter of a week, anyway. And, uh, and only on a matter of a uh, little software problem. So, in 82, they released the infamous Commodore 64. Uh, 64. Originally, it was planned to call it the Week 30, but uh, Texas Instruments were already, uh, uh, already running a very aggressive uh, marketing campaign against the Week 20, and they didn't want it to be uh, the people to think it as a successor of the Week 20, because uh, the Week 20 was already, already considered very obsolete. So Commodore 64 was released, and later in 84, Commodore 64, uh, Jack Tremiel was removed from Commodore. Uh, that was a very bad move. Actually, he left the company on uh, 13th of February, which happened to be a Friday. That was the black day for Commodore. From there, nothing uh, was going as, as supposed that uh, Commodore, and Jack Tremiel went and purchased Atari. So. He was now running the competition of his original company. So very interesting. So there were some more Commodore models released, 8-bit Commodore models uh, released. Like on the picture you see the Commodore Plus 4, and you know there was uh, plenty more. You can see them in the book. But neither of them was uh, just as successful as the Commodore 64. Uh, it turned out that the Commodore 64 is a deadly competition even to Commodore itself. So. Uh, there was just one very interesting model, the Commodore 65. That was the last 8-bit model which was not released. Uh, it was manufactured, you know, uh, there were a few hundred of these made. Uh, they were stashed away in some storage because they uh, purchased Amiga, and that's why they didn't release it. And after the liquidation of Commodore, some collectors uh, got these computers. You can find the details in the book, it's a very interesting machine, but sorry, we don't really have plenty of time. Let's go on. The beginnings of the Commodore 64 scene. The early cracker scene, you know, it all started on the Apple with cracking games and putting their names in it. There was no point for that, they just put the name in it. Later, they also removed the copy protection, now then there was a point for that. But it was continued on the 64 scene. As you see, this is a high score table of Wizard of War, a very famous game, and there you see a cracker put his name in it. The term reels appeared with a guy called Ali. He was a trader. He was the first, a German trader, he was the first uh, to release uh, cracked wares uh, packed uh, with his name included. 
Well, this was a very, a very uh, important step because uh, no one was caring about the uh, spreading or uh, or the, the reputation of their releases. They just released it, and there you go. They copied it to their friends. Okay, this was the big uh, idea of Ali to release it as a product. And uh, the first crackers uh, were using different cracking methods. The first was the so-called reset cracking. That was a very simple method, you know, just, you just press the reset button of the Commodore 64 and the contents of the memory remained intact. So you could extract it and modify it, like if you have freeze the running program. Later there were freezing modules released, which did the same without resetting the computer. You just pressed it, uh, it was a, a module you could pr uh, connect to the cartridge port. You press the button and the entire memory content of the 64 was saved. What was still considered lame, the real cracking came when they used uh, machine code monitors to uh, alter the running program. Now that's the real cracking, it's really an art. Some people sitting here maybe can explain it. But it's not really about the methods of the crackers, but the competition among them. There was a, a new competition rising who can write their names more nicely into the game. So it was not enough just to type uh, your name into the high score table. Uh, they wanted something more. And that's war that was where cracker intros appeared. On the picture, you can see one of the first intros. It was German cracking service. It was very primitive. These letters, GCS, had just scrolled into the picture. They were moved around a little and stopped. And then this text was displayed under it. And uh, these were the first cracker intros. And one of the other first animated cracker intros, the other one, is this Bert. This was a, a Holland group. This was uh, trying to uh, animate the letters like if they were rotating. That's very primitive. Well, around 86, it was the beginnings of the real scene. Real scene, I mean, uh, when the groups get in contact with each other. Uh, they were not only corresponding with each other in mail, sending stuff to and back and using BBSs, but they already had some uh, paper magazines, so-called fanzines, and uh, they had gatherings uh, that were the first demo parties, and uh, they did all the things we do nowadays as legal uh, seniors. Of course, they did it on a much smaller scale. Let's go on. The first demos appeared in the Cracker era when the first demo makers were working for the Crackers to make nice intros because there was a competition. You know, uh, there were several areas of competition between Cracker groups, who is the fastest, who can do the best cracks, the 100 person cracks and stuff. And there was also who can make the best intros. And that's why they employed uh, special guys who were just uh, taking care of these animations. On this picture, you can see the first example uh, of the raster bars. It is the Dynamic Duo uh, crack intro. Actually, it is their only cracker intro. I guess you know Dynamic Duo, there was a very famous uh, uh, crack group back in the 80s. Invention of the first demo effects, yes, just as I said, the raster bar, or the sideboarder scroller, when they managed to remove the sideboarder of the Commodore 64 and run a scroller on it or put graphics on it. This is a demo titled Suburbia from uh, 1001 on uh, 1001, whatever you call them, crew from Holland, they were the masters of screen border removal. Actually, they were not the first to remove the border. There was a Commodore 64, an Amiga coder called Sodan, who managed to remove the border earlier, but that was in a game. The first example to remove the border in the demo is this. Or there was the first single part demos, demos as we know it nowadays, uh, demonstration programs just made for fun. There were no, no crack behind them. There were not cracker intros, they were just uh, spectacular little programs released in themselves. Uh, this were the birth of the demo scene around 85, 86. One of the very famous demo makers were a duo of Ash and Dave. They were English uh, coders. But uh, there were other demo makers like uh, the judges. They were the South African group. On this picture, you see the so-called FLD effect. And this is a, a very good example of a technical demonstration demo, a tech demo, so to say. Uh, well, this is a still picture, but imagine this is a scroller running upwards, and the rows of the, uh, of the scroller, the distance between the rows is dynamically changing, like if it were made of rubber, and it's jumping up and down. Now, this is called flexible line distance, FLD. This was the first demo effect with the name. Uh, later, this, the, later, this FLD thing was developed to uh, many, many other uh, effects. And uh, there is a sharp line we can, where we can uh, coincide the separation, the cracker, and the demo scene. Uh, that is uh, 
1989 at the Ikari Zargon party. What happened there? Well, demo makers uh, were not really considered part of the scene. They were considered as lamers. Not really lamers, but uh, close to them. The real elite was the crackers. And anyone who did cracks were a cool guy, and uh, those who made demos were just, well, nice guys, or so to say. Uh, well, demo makers could live with that, but not after this party, because it happened that uh, there was a demo competition, and it was also a crack competition at this party, because back then there were already competitions. And uh, the organizers, Ikari, had the idea of winning the compo. Well, they did it without a demo, because they wanted to win their own party. And uh, they changed the, the rankings of the, in the results file. They put themselves on the first uh, place, so they took the prize, and uh, they completely messed up the results. And everybody on the demo scene were uh, pretty upset about this. Nobody cared on the cracker scene, however, because they didn't care about demos. They said, who cares who wins the demo compo? But uh, for long months, there were uh, angry comments on this in demo scrollers, in magazines, in disc magazines, because there were already disc magazines at this time. And uh, from then, the, the demo groups were not really working for cracker groups anymore. Well, it took a few years for them to completely separate, but uh, here is a line where we can say the independent demo scene has started. Meanwhile, what happened meanwhile? Yeah, the Commodore launched Atari 1000. Uh, actually, did you know that uh, the birthday of the Amiga was just a few days ago? The 20th birthday of the Amiga. And uh, by coincidence, my book was uh, uh, released on that day. Uh, it, uh, it was finished printing on that day. So. In 82, there was a little company called Hitoro. You remember I mentioned Jay Miner, an engineer of Atari 4. In 82, they suggested building a 16-bit console machine to Atari, but they rejected it. They didn't feel the necessity of building that super computer yet. So he quit Atari and uh, started to find uh, investors on his own. Well, it took him two years, but he managed, and they found a company called Hitoro. Uh, they started to design a 16-bit multiprocessor system. This was a very novel thing back then. Remember, it was 82. The Commodore 64 was just released, and they were already dreaming about something that later became the Amiga 1000. There on the picture, you see the prototype of the Amiga 1000. It was codenamed the Lorraine. And uh, those big circuits around it, these are the chips, the, uh, the famous Amiga custom chips, before they were miniaturized. It was working, actually. Uh, they had some novelties, like the blitter, the copper, and uh, all kinds of chips in it. The, the blitter was a device of uh, memory uh, area copying. That it, it, made, uh, uh, it made it possible to copy large areas of the memory to another position, which maybe doesn't sound so uh, interesting, but it really sped up screen uh, operations. And the copper was another graphic, uh, graphical uh, Mm, coprocessor, that's what it means, coprocessor, copper. And uh, it had a set of other processors for uh, music uh, management, uh, for peripheral handlings and stuff. So it wasn't a fast computer, but, uh, but the, the coprocessors uh, finally made it very fast. And it was a, 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 a very new uh, concept of building a computer around uh, multiple processors because, uh, you know, uh, it, the best uh, computers of the, uh, of the time were all using one CPU and uh, maybe uh, some little processors as coprocessors, like the Commodore 64. But for example, the PC was built around one uh, processor, even to the 80s, despite of the intelligent cards and stuff. So uh, this was the first multimedia computer that uh, had digital sound and uh, color graphics, and uh, it was also the first with a mouse that was sold with a mouse. It had a multitasking operating system, which was another novelty. And in uh, 84, it was presented at the Chicago Computer Electronics Show. Yeah, that device you have seen on the previous picture was displaying this demo. This was called the Boeing. This ball was rotating. It was bouncing around with a sound like Boeing, Boeing. That was something at this time. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, people were just gathering around the Amiga booth and uh, trying to find a supercomputer because they just simply couldn't believe that, that that heap of cables can display this image. It was a very big thing at its time. Uh, they were trying to find investors because uh, they were already on the uh, verge of bankruptcy. Unfortunately, they couldn't find anyone. And then came Atari with Jack Tramiel. 
uh, Jack Tremiel uh, gave them uh, $500,000 loan. And uh, when they couldn't pay it back, they offered some, uh, <coughs> how much? No, not much. So uh, they offered to buy the uh, purchase the entire company, but without the uh, developers, without uh, the concept and everything. Uh, so he only wanted the computer to be built by Atari. And finally, Atari really built a prototype of the Amiga that was called the Mickey. Uh, but it was never released, and no one, no one has ever seen this computer because security at Atari was very tight, and even today the developers don't talk about what they were doing in the Atari labs, while you can uh, know a lot about Commodore prototypes. Well, whatever, uh, Commodore uh, offered a much better price for Amiga, so they purchased it and not Jack Tramiel with Atari. That's why nowadays we have Commodore Amiga and not Atari Amiga. The next one, yes, Atari and Commodore were battling for it. And in 85, the Amiga 1000, the first model was intro introduced, followed by Amiga 2500, two years later. You know, this was the concept. They had uh, the basic model, that was the Amiga 2000, and a cheaper model for home users, that's the 500. On the picture, you see the Amiga 500 with the monitor. And it was followed in 92 with the most advanced models, the Amiga 4000 and the uh, one, two, one, two hundred. Let's go on. The advanced demo scene started in 1991, or around it. The Amiga was fresh ground. The Amiga was literally designed uh, for demo coding, uh, for graphical effects and stuff. The first groups uh, immediately appeared on it in uh, 86, when it was released, 85, 86. Uh, but uh, it took a few years till the Amiga scene was really built up. Around uh, 89 or, eight, uh, or 90, it was already a swarming demo scene on the Amiga. Many Commodore 64 groups uh, moved from 64 to Amiga, uh, despite that the home computer market was still dominated by the 64. You know, the Amiga was a little bit expensive back then. Uh, meanwhile, on the 64, Okay, on the Amiga, there were the first demos. Here you see the Aerosign Mega demo. This uh, was a very, uh, very famous multi-part demo, one of the first big multi-part demos on the Amiga. It was not the first, but uh, it was the first that really showed the capabilities of the Amiga, because the Amiga coders, were the, uh, at the first time, were not really uh, taking advantage of the Amiga's uh, capabilities, but just recoded 60 Commodore 64 effects on the Amiga. So, on the 64, there was a revolution, about 88 and 90. Uh, there were many multi-part demos. And in 91, there was Dutch Breeze, what you see on the picture. Dutch Breeze uh, was one of the biggest demos ever made on the 64, and it started a new uh, demo scene era. Well, this was the, well, the first big multi-part demo, but the last one that was solely built on graphical, graphical tricks, like scrollers and... Uh, uh, stretchers and stuff, so old school effects, because the next one was already a record rush demo, so to say. Crest was a German group, and uh, their main coder was Crossbow. He was always experimenting with new effects, with sprite multiplexers, like uh, displaying multiple sprites. You know, the Commodore 64 was capable of displaying eight sprites, little graphical objects on the screen. But he was experimenting with 255 and stuff, and uh, a record rush has started. Who can uh, make more sprites on the Commodore 64? The same was going on in the Amiga, and uh, this uh, record rush had reached other areas, like... Uh, who had the more faces in a 3D object, and maybe you all remember that. Who has the longest scroller, stuff like that. So Crest uh, was very important because they were one of the most active groups in the, the time of this demo revolution, and uh, they have invented a lot of demo effects that, are, that were used for years. Uh, on this picture, you see their very famous demo, Ice Cream Castle, which was uh, as novel uh, for the coders as a uh, Dutch breeze for designers. So these two demos have started the big revolution in the 64. Uh, later, <coughs> uh, after, after Crest demo, mathematical tricks have appeared in demos, mainly 3D graphics, but also some other stuff. Uh, 3D uh, vector graphics uh, was the big novelty of this time. Here in this picture, you see Tabu's demo placed in space. Uh, and the general demo format of the time was like this. There was a logo on the top, a scroller on the button, and the effect in the middle. For long years, all demos looked alike. 
like this. This is an Amiga demo because uh, there were new effects developed in the Amiga 2. Here you see the first glance vector, glass lens vector, a uh, little bit transparent. The Amiga takes over the scene in a few years. More, more demos were written on the Amiga, and now the Amiga coders from around 90 were not uh, recalling Commodore 64 effects anymore, but were developing there on their own, taking advantage of the Amiga already, taking advantage of its advanced multiprocessor uh, uh, architecture and uh, the capabilities of the graphical processors. Meanwhile, on the 64 scene, the 64 coders have adapted the Amiga style, and we're trying to code Amiga effects on the 64, so transfer turning. And from then on, the Amiga scene was affecting the 64 scene and not vice versa. <coughs> Here you can see Origo Dreamline's demo. Uh, or that's the title, Origo Dreamline, uh, with the dot vector effect, which is uh, really uh, 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 a typical Amiga effect. Let's go on. TrackMOS came in around 91 to 93. It was an era of TrackMOS. What is a TrackMO? Well, a TrackMO was uh, a new term that was uh, first invented by Scoopex's coder. Uh, Scoopex released the uh, demo Mental Hangover in 1990. Uh, the concept of the track mo uh, is that while the demo is running, one of the demo effects is running, the next is already loading, and there is no pause between the two parts. Because uh, till then, uh, after the demo part has ended, you had to press space or something like that to load the next part, and there was a loading part. Uh, there was a scroller or something like that, and the next part was loading, and you had to wait for that. Now it was over. The track mo was uh, running like a video clip constantly. And that there was another novelty why it was called a track mo because it was not using uh, the regular disk format. So it was not readable uh, from DOS, Amiga DOS. It was using a custom disk format. Well, this was actually not a novelty because uh, some demos were using it earlier and even games. Uh, but the track mos used it uh, to speed up disk operations. So the part loading will be faster. Uh, where have I put it? Here it is. On the uh, 64 scene, uh, this idea was also adapted. The first track mode was Triad's Red Storm, as you can see here. Uh, well, it was not a, not a really nice demo, so to say, compared to its uh, contemporaries, but it was the first track mode on the 64. And later, the 64 uh, coders had, uh, had big difficulties with adapting this uh, technique because uh, it was not really fit uh, for the 64. But uh, finally, there was a game titled G.I. Joe, and it had a very good loader. It was ripped out, and uh, even today, different versions of this loader are used in the Commodore 64 demos. Meanwhile, on the Amiga, they were still following the old Commodore 64 style, but it was improving. Uh, effects were getting uh, better and better all the time. Here in this picture, you see a Sanity demo with a, a waving uh, Star Wars scroller. Uh, that was practically impossible to do, but uh, you know, there's nothing impossible for, a, for an old-school coder. And a very important thing on the Amiga scene, the ASCII scene has appeared. You know what was that? Drawing first. It was about drawing logos and stuff from characters for file ID uh, files and later for info files. And finally, it evolved to the art of releasing uh, uh, ASCII packs. They were text files with logos, a collection of logos for different groups and graphics. And uh, sometimes there were some little poems or messages among them. And it was released as a text file, it's a pack. And at the same time, the first PC demos has appeared. Actually, the very first ones uh, were already around in the 80s, but the first real demos, which we can call demos in the uh, sense what we mean, uh, was appearing at around 1991. Uh, on this picture, you see the Vector demo by Ultra Force. It was a very famous demo of its time. Its maker, uh, Arian Bruze, has released the first book about 3D coding later. On the Amiga, they were making the first packs. What was a pack? Uh, a swapper collected uh, a lot of uh, releases, like uh, intros, demos, whatever, collected them into a pack and uh, put a little front intro and a menu. Uh, here you can see such a menu. So the user could select what he wants to see. Uh, <coughs> Pack making became a very popular activity, and since packs were very easy to make, there were many loosey packs released soon, and uh, a very, very few swappers were releasing good packs in a few years. Uh, but packs are still around these days, and there was a special uh, branch of pack making. It was the pack mag, mag disc magazines that were also packs uh, that contained uh, little uh, tidbits like intros and stuff to be watched. 
In the background, there was Atari. Remember, we left Jack Tremiel when he wanted to buy the Amiga, but he failed. But what he was doing, and what was Atari doing before Jack Tremiel arrived? Now, this was an alternative demo platform, and I guess not many of you know about what was going on the Atari ST scene. In the 70s, there was the first game arcades. Yeah, I already told about this. This is Pong, a contemporary poster. The Atari VCS started a console revolution, and there came the first Atari home computers. These were uh, released before the week 20, because they were released in 1979. Uh, These were the Atari 400 and 800. Two very good computers. These were the last designs by uh, J Minor for the Atari. Uh, actually, they were superior to the week 20 in a few uh, areas, but not generally. So the week 20 could dominate the market. Uh, but they were still very good computers. The 400 was designed for uh, for kids. That's why you see the membrane keys. And the 800 was the real one. Later, they had an 8-bit series, the XL, uh, Atari XL series. It was uh, often mocked uh, extra lame. It was a major flop. Nobody really liked these computers, and it was not really an opponent for Com Commodore. So uh, this was one of the reasons why Atari was drifting towards bankruptcy. And the other thing that was uh, uh, consoles, the console uh, market was going down that time. Everybody told that uh, no one will ever use console, uh, game consoles again because we have the home computers. So yes, uh, there was an attempt to acquire Amiga. And here is supposed to be a picture about the Mickey, but no one has it so far. Finally, when they failed to acquire the Amiga, they had the idea of building the Amiga without the custom chips. And the result was the Atari ST, the 1632-bit computer. Uh, interestingly enough, it was designed by the same guy who designed the Commodore 64, Shiraz B. Shivji, because some of the Commodore engineers left uh, Commodore M1 to Atari with Jack Tremiel. The Atari ST series had a, it was a family of uh, many different computers for long years. The ST, the ST Plus, ST Plus uh, the Atari TT, the Stacy laptop. Uh, they were very famous uh, for their musical capabilities because, because the ST computers had MIDI in and out ports. And many famous mu musicians actually used the Atari ST during their concerts, like Madonna, Tangerine Dream, Prodigy. They were all using it. Finally, they released the Atari Falcon in 92. It was supposed to be a competitor for the Amiga 1200. Uh, it didn't have custom chips, but it had a, a very special digital signal processor. It was the DSP processor, which is capable of performing the same tasks as the uh, Amiga custom chips, uh, all of them uh, together. So the DSP was capable of, uh, for example, JPEG extraction, uh, animation playing, music playing, whatever you want. It was a very good computer, but it was still not a competitor for the Amiga. So it failed on the market. Soon Atari went bankrupt. And uh, this computer was manufactured for a few years on by a little German company. Uh, but nowadays, it's, it's very hard to come by. The Atari ST scene, yeah, that's interesting. What was the Atari ST scene? Well, around 1990, there was the first little music demos. Music demos were a collection of correct. Uh, converted uh, musics. Usually they converted Commodore 64 musics, and this is a very good example of what you see on the screen. This is little music demo. That was a collection of converted Rob Hubbard musics. And uh, there was no connection with the 64 on the Amiga scene. There were not, uh, the traditions of the, these two uh, old scenes were not uh, really appearing on the Amiga scene. And that's why uh, it had a very special style that is not even similar to these. Uh, for example, even the slang is different on the Atari scene. For example, they call demo parts screens, not parts. And if we go on, for example, the reset screen is a special uh, Atari uh, feature. The reset screen was like, uh, on the Atari ST, it's possible to recode the reset routine. So when you press the reset button, the computer will not restart, but it starts a new part of the demo. That was the reset screen. And there were some demos that uh, featured a so big reset part so that the demo itself was just a little intro. But if you press the reset button, it played the entire demo itself. And even that demo had a special reset screen. Yeah, it's very interesting. The first uh, demo with a reset screen was uh, the Electra demo by a Swedish group, Electra, in 1991. 
and that had that big reset screen I just mentioned. Around uh, 1988, they already had multi-screen or multi-part demos on the Atari ST, and the leading groups of this era were all Swedish, like uh, Care Beers. They had many demos, like the Junk demo, the Swedish New Year demo, the Cuddly demos, the So What demo, What the Heck demo, and the next invention were the menus. The demo menus and most of the uh, further Atari uh, specialties have appeared with one demo that was called the Union Demo. Uh, one of the special features were that demos were not uh, usually not written by one single group, but many groups, many groups contributed with different screens to a demo. And these screens were not necessarily demo parts, so not like uh, some spectacular demo effect, but sometimes there were music parts where you could play music. You know, the Atari ST was uh, not really capable of playing digital music, so if you coded a, a model player, then first you were a very good coder, but uh, you had to use up to 30 or 40% of uh, CPU time for playing a, a module music, so we didn't really have a, a processor time to play uh, demo effects. Um, Sometimes these parts, the screens, contain games. Uh, like, for example, there is a demo called uh, Frog is Over the Fence that has a Tetris conversion in it. Very interesting. So these demos are uh, not really demos in the sense we know it, but uh, like uh, entertainment programs, so to say. Uh, so this was the first uh, demo, the Union demo, that featured uh, demo menus. The demo menu was uh, like a little adventure game. You see it on the screen. It is not from Union Demo, but uh, it's uh, very similar. You had a little character, and you have to approach little doors and open it to see the different parts. It was like a, like a, uh, exploring a dungeon with a character. Uh, sometimes uh, the menus were more uh, simpler. Sometimes they were just regular demos, so you know you were moving a bar over uh, labels and choose what you wanted. But usually they made this uh, this nice uh, game menus. And uh, the Union demo was the first to use a special, demo, a special disk format, which was not uh, copied with, with normal programs. It had a special copy screen, so a special routine to copy the demos, while users were not really fond of that, because they wanted to copy the demo fast. And it was impossible with uh, copier utilities. So there came the crackers, and this was the first case when crackers cracked the demo. It was very funny. Yes, and later, because these uh, custom disk formats were really uh, in fashion, crackers were regularly uh, cracking demos, and demo makers were putting copy protections in it, like in games. <laughs> it happened, yes. And uh, later, the crackers started to release so-called compilations. They ripped out entire screens from a demo and assembled, a, uh, so to say, it was a pack, like on the Amiga, but they didn't include the entire production, but only the best screens, and it was called a compilation. So that was it. 3D routines were rare on the ST because of the poor uh, CPU capabilities. And there were no digital music except in a few demos that contained so-called Digi Music screens. Now, there's the Atari ST scene. And meanwhile, on the Amiga, the beginnings of the design, the design era has uh, started. And it all started with Melon Design. You know what, what Melon Design did? They had the idea of making a demo that is not built on marvelous code or something like that, but design, graphical design. And uh, some liked their style, some didn't. Uh, some said that the demo must uh, be about uh, coding tricks and stuff. Others really liked this style because this was something new. Uh, their main, uh, main style, uh, so mainly their style uh, was about using smart colors, uh, some figures, graphics, uh, little figures, you remember the uh, typical Melon Design style was always uh, about uh, little childish objects on the screen, like little dwarfs or uh, little stars, and some, some people said it's like Sesame Street, but, well, it was a style. And uh, they didn't call it demos, they called them Melonstrations, for a reason, because they said they are not demos. Uh, well, our, a year later, Many people were bored of this style, and uh, there was an opposite trend. They were called the coder demos. Demos which were still built around code, but superior to the older demos. And one of the very good examples are the Kefrans demos, or the Sanity demos. On the picture, you can see the Guardian Dragon. Uh, I think it's the Guardian Dragon 2, maybe. No, it's 1. Whatever. So apart from Guardian Dragon. And uh, 
there was a, a great change in the musical styles too, because uh, you know the first demo music were just uh, trying so first tryings of uh, teenager guys, except for, uh, with a few exceptions. You know, the first big musicians were like uh, Romeo Knight or Format and other guys. But uh, around 92 and 93, there were already some professional uh, musicians on the scene, uh, like, uh, for example, Jasper Kidd, uh, Bjorn Lynn, also known as Dr. Afsam, Black Star, and other guys. And there were two styles that time, three uh, more precisely. One was the general little kid plays the music style. Uh, the other was the uh, the professional style, uh, that was a little bit experimental. Uh, musicians were already experimenting with styles like rock, blues, something jazz, whatever. And there was the techno music. The techno was relatively new, you know, uh, in, uh, around this time, the techno music was uh, at first appearing in clubs and uh, discos. And some people liked techno, some didn't, because it was, it was relatively simple to make techno, but it was still very hard to make good techno. And uh, there was a lot of debates about uh, techno music at the time, uh, but finally uh, techno took over and uh, most of the demos had techno music till around 93 or so. Uh, for example, uh, if you remember the demo State of the Art, that was the first big techno demo. That was uh, the first uh, big triumph of the techno. There were new techniques uh, for pixel graphics. You know, the Omega 500 had said only 32 colors. Uh, but uh, graphics had to draw with this, but it was already much, much better than the Commodore 64 because the Commodore 64 was not only just 16 colors, uh, it uh, was very restricted because you just couldn't just draw on the screen and that's it. Uh, the Commodore 64 screen was divided to little uh, blocks, so-called uh, attribute cells. Uh, in an attribute cell, the size was depending on the graphics mode you were using. In one attribute cell, you could use only a limited number of colors. Like, for example, uh, four pixel uh, by two pixel cell, you could use two colors of the 16. While on the Amiga, you had the freedom of drawing, but it still needed guts uh, because 32 colors aren't enough. They were the first uh, big efficiencies. The new technologies involved the use of scanners and sketches. So the Graphicians were not just drawing on the screen anymore, but draw something on paper, they scanned it, and finished the graphics on uh, computer. Many, many uh, graphicians despised this method because they said it's, it's not really art. Well, we know it is. It got much worse years later. And uh, there was a method on the Commodore 64 called wiring. It was uh, drawing the graphics on a stronger computer like on the Amiga or the PC and converting it to the Commodore 64 with a wire. That's why it's called wired, wiring. Meanwhile, the demo scene has turned into a serious art subculture. Uh, demos uh, were, uh, demo parties were growing bigger and bigger all the time, you know. Uh, though in 91, there was the first the party, the first party with more than 1,000 visitors. And uh, there were already really big events. And some demos, uh, especially the first wild demo, it was a uh, global trash too. If you remember that, it was uh, the first display in the the party. It was all even played on MTV because it was requested by so many viewers. So it has turned into a serious art subculture, and if you take a look at the, the artifacts of uh, the contemporary demo scene, you can see that it, it, was, it was really art. So if you take a look at this picture, this was a splash screen of Row, a uh, very famous disc magazine of the time. This graphics in the middle uses only 12 colors. Now this is something. Yeah, in 92, that was the first assembly. So far, it wasn't a PC party, but it already had PC compose. And years later, it, it developed what it is now, uh, one of the leading parties of the PC scene. Uh, yeah, the other is, uh, ST scene was slowly adapting to Amiga Trends and styles. So the traditional demo menus were eventually disappearing, and they were picking up the Amiga Trackmo style. And uh, for a few years, the Amiga ST scene was uh, living in the shadow of the Amiga scene, but around 93 or 94, it was on the verge of disappearing. And there are very few Atari demos uh, made these, day, uh, these days. Well, mostly they are still made on Atari ST or Falcon, but it's a very small scene nowadays. And yeah, meanwhile, there was the, the party 92. That was the first intro competition uh, with size limitation for intro. It was uh, 40 kilobytes. The winner was the Tetris intro by Melon Design. If you remember that, it was a little intro. There were some uh, Tetris shapes falling, and there was a, a Russian music under it. It was a very cute little intro. Let's go on. Rise of the PC scene. 
and we are still have we still have 12 years. Oh wow! <laughs> Crystal Dream 2 and Second Reality started it all. Well, there were demos before them, but these were the first demos that contained stuff that was uh, comparable to contemporary Amiga demos, or even superior to it. You know, the, uh, the Amiga, uh, the PC was always, always despised by the Amigans because it had poor sound, poor graphics and stuff, and it was a very weak computer. But uh, when, it, uh, when the 486 processors were around, and uh, we also had the Gravis Ultra sound, if you remember that, uh, it uh, suddenly turned into a monster, which was superior to Amiga. And uh, it wasn't clear yet it, if it will overtake the Amiga as the primary demo platform, but nowadays we know it did. The Gravis Ultrasound, you remember this card, it was a huge inspirational push. It was a, a wavetable uh, sound card. You know what it means? It, uh, it was not playing a digital sound. It was playing actually, but it was not playing, a, just replaying digital sound or trying to mimic sounds with the uh, frequency modulation. But it, uh, it had a patch set, a set of uh, digitized sound samples and you could play music through it. Or if you're playing your own samples, like a module or something like that, it had its, uh, it had its individual mixing processor, so you, couldn't, uh, you needn't use the CPU to slow down your program and uh, to, to do the mixing. Now that was the novelty of the Gravis Ultra sound. And Advanced Gravis, it was a Canadian company, has distributed a lot of uh, these cards to the leading uh, PC groups, like Future Crew and Triton stuff. So they made, the made their demos on the Gravis Ultra sound. And in one year, it was the primary card of the PC scene. So no demos were supporting the Sound Blaster anymore. Everybody was writing their demos for the Gravis Ultra sound. So it was a wise marketing idea, so to say. Yeah, the first PC trackers has appeared. You know, on the Amiga, you have four uh, digital sound channels. So the Amiga module format was a uh, four-channel module format. On the PC, you could uh, use more channels. And the first multi-channel PC tracker was a uh, uh, screen tracker. Uh, what you can see on the picture is the 3.1 version, the last version. It was uh, made by Future Crew. And uh, the ASCII scene had a development. It was the ANSI scene on the PC, because on the PC you could use color uh, in the text mode graphics. Well, ANSI scene is mainly an American phenomenon. Uh, there are some uh, European ANSI groups that are very good, but uh, generally ANSI groups are all Americans. And uh, the main purpose of the ANSI graphics were to, uh, to develop uh, user interfaces for the BBSs, because they were text-based. Okay, the first PC disk Max appeared at this time, and uh, the, some of them were very serious, like the Infobia, which you can see on the picture. And there was another very good uh, magazine to mention, it was Senial, if you remember that. And Senial and Infobia were uh, quite the opposite of each other. Uh, the slogan of Infobia was clean and cool, and that's what it was. It was a clean and cool magazine, it was a, a combed and... Uh, quasi-scientific scene magazine, while Senial was a, a wild old schooler, uh, so to say, party magazine or something like that, uh, the magazine of the big guys, it was, uh, the slogan was dirty and hot. Later, the AGA appeared in 93-94, when the Amiga 4000 and Amiga 1200 uh, was appeared, it made the Amiga 500 obsolete. Uh, and the hard disk appeared on the Amiga scene. It made the track mode style obsolete. Uh, now what the demos were running from the hard disk. Uh, the track mode was uh, obsolete and there were no flop disk required anymore. They were in use, of course, but uh, the demos from them on were all file demos, as they call them. The Amiga demo scene at this time was completely, as you can read there, self-sustaining. What does it mean? Uh, well, everybody was using utilities and user programs written by seniors, like uh, packers and uh, assembly compilers and uh, stuff like that, music programs. Well, one of the few ex uh, exceptions was Deluxe Paint, a very good drawing program. But uh, usually Amigans were uh, using public domain software all the time. Now, that's something that will never happen on the PC scene, I think. Linux, yeah, Linux, okay. <laughs> but it's not the same, actually. I mean, everybody was using them. So in the Aga age, uh, 256 colors are, are not, uh, more than 32, certainly. Uh, but uh, it ignited some heated debates about it because some old graphicians thought that it is the end of the scene. Of course, the scene is dead, as we know. <laughs> 
but uh, they said that uh, it, it is no uh, point of drawing with so much colors because uh, we can just scan a painting or something like that and no one will tell if it's scanned because there is, uh, you cannot uh, see the, the, I will show you what you won't see if I can. So you, don't, you won't see, for example, the dittering. I zoom in. If you magnify an old picture from whatever, Mm. Okay, so if you magnify a painting from the Amiga 500 age, you can see here, for example, the dittering. Because there are so few colors, you have to ditter the colors yourself if you want a gradient like here. Uh, if you want it, you cannot just paint a gradient, you have two or three colors, and you have to mix the pixels by yourself. And this is called dittering. It needs patience and skill. Now, this is not required if you are using uh, 256 colors anymore. Uh, despite of the debates, many of the greatest graphicians were adapting to the new standards. Until the end of the, years, uh, end of the year, most graphics uh, were drawn with 256 colors for AGA or drawn on the PC. And the first ray tracers, hey, go back. Don't rush. The first ray tracer programs were appearing uh, back then. You know what is a ray tracer program? It's a 3D graphics suit. Uh, the first tracers were the Pope Ray, Persistence of Vision, and Imagine. And uh, many seniors immediately started to use them because it was easy to make uh, fancy graphics with it without uh, the skill of a pixel graphician. This is a very good example of what you can see on the picture. Uh, soon they realized that uh, even 3D graphics need skills. And uh, the term ray tracer graphician has appeared on the scene. People that were uh, specialized in 3D graphics and modeling. Meanwhile, the Polish demo scene was growing. Poland had, uh, they had the demo scene but was very, very weak. And uh, around 93 or uh, 94, it was flourishing again. Uh, there were no importer groups, or not many, but there were many demo groups, and uh, they had many disc magazines, and soon they were making uh, state-of-the-art demos that got abroad. On the picture, you can see Technological Desk by Medax from 93. It was one of the very successful, internationally successful Polish demos. Uh, where am I? Yeah, they were very, isol very isolated. Since they had no connection with uh, foreign seniors, foreign groups, they had uh, no uh, contact with foreign BBSs, the uh, Polish scene was a little inbred and a little isolated. They had their own trends. They had their own disc magazines written in Polish language. They had their own BBSs only called by Polish users. And they had big parties only visited by Polish. Uh, so, for example, there was Intel outside, uh, the first Polish party that reached 1,000 visitors. But uh, only three or four of them were foreigners. The German scene was also growing this time. Uh, funnily enough, uh, Germany didn't have a strong demo scene except for Sanity and a few other groups. Uh, but in uh, 93 and 94, there was suddenly there was a, a boom on the German scene. On the picture, you can see Never Like Do Know. This was a, a very nice uh, slideshow by a new graphician called Fade One. Uh, he appeared out of nowhere with his uh, brilliant graphics. And uh, for years, he was one of the best uh, active graphicians on the Amiga scene. And uh, the Germans were also starting to organize big parties, like, for example, Black Box Symposium in 1995, uh, as I recall well, uh, which later developed into Mecca Symposium when it got unified with Mecca, a PC party. And that is, uh, nowadays, it's called Breakpoint. The era of Tori and Ducks, you remember this time when everybody was displaying uh, Taurus or Duck in the demo? Uh, yes, it all started with an Amiga intro, uh, demo, sorry. Uh, it was GeForce by Pygmy Projects. And it was the first to employ Guru shading on a 3D object. It was a quite boring demo at this time, and even nowadays it is, to be straight. It is uh, nothing else but rotating objects, very nicely shaded. It required hell of a hardware, four megabytes of memory. Everybody cursed them. Who the hell has four megabytes memory? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second place demo on the same uh, competition was Follow Red Color by Razer. Uh, it also contained Goro shading, but it was not animated. So this new demo style uh, was quickly widespread, especially on the PC. Uh, there were all, uh, soon there were also uh, PC demos with many grow shaded objects, and this trend uh,
came back to the Amiga, and there were Amiga demos made, which were set to resemble PC demos. This is uh, where the Amiga and the PC were running head by head as two demo platforms. On the picture, you see a demo by Musashi, a very famous uh, Polish coder, who was the first to release demos on foreign parties. Uh, this one was released at the party. Uh, why the Amiga was uh, behind the PC in 3D graphics? The reason is uh, the so-called planar screen handling, which required a special technology to be developed that was called C2P technology, chunky to planar. Here you can see uh, schematics of the Amiga screen management, how planar method works. Well, I guess most of you have already coded a PC back in the uh, VGA age. Video graphics array, the VGA was working very simply. It's called a chunky screen management. You had an array of bytes. If you wanted to paint a pixel to a uh, given color, let's say black, which was the 10th color of the palette, you just said that I want uh, on this and this uh, byte this value, 10. And that was painted black. Now it's very fast and it can be very well used for uh, 3D graphics and stuff. But the Amiga was a little bit uh, more difficult. The C2P was uh, required because the planar, uh, planar screen handling worked the following. As you can see, there were bit planes. Bit planes were like, imagine them as, as planes where you can set single bits on or off. There are many planes on each other, and if you add uh, the bits that are over each other, you will get a value. So, on the picture, if you want, there is this little dragon for bubble bubble. If you want, uh, to paint a pixel black, as you can see there in the eye of the dragon. This is the fifth color of the palette. So we had set five on that value. What should we do? Uh, we have to set three uh, bits, three uh, bit planes on that position, because if we add them, uh, the first, the second, and the third bit planes, the first will give us one, the second will give us two, and the third will give us four as a value. And this will be, oh, I don't really see it on the screen. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit. So whatever, if you add these uh, values, you will get the correct value to paint the pixel, the color of the pixel. But this is very slow because you have to perform three operations for one result. And that's why they had the C2P. Uh, the C2P was uh, only a simple idea of not drawing on the screen, but they assembled the image in the memory, like uh, they emulated chunky planar handling. And when the, the image was assembled in the memory, they just copied on the screen, and it was much faster. Uh, still, usually C2P routines, uh, C2P demos were already running on accelerated Amigas because there were accelerator boards already available. Uh, meanwhile, there was a new disk revolution. On the Amiga, there was the ROM, the rewarding orthographical masterpiece, and on PC, the Infobia. Uh, the new idea was, uh, till that time, disk Macs were just written by kids. They were using a quite rude language. They were not uh, really following the rules of journalism, and uh, they were just written as, as it happened. Uh, the new idea was to make a demanding disk Mac uh, with good language, with uh, uh, with correct information about everything, not rumors, uh, they were, and not to use uh, journalism to, to despise other groups. And uh, the result was these two disc mags, which uh, really revolutionized uh, disc magazines as we know them. And uh, even today, uh, even today the, the principles of disc mag making are originated from these two uh, magazines. For example, if you're reading Pain, the, you know, Pain, the disc mag, uh, even Darkness, the organizer of Infobia, said it's, it's very similar to uh, the old Infobia. Why well, it's not accidental. Uh, meanwhile, the internet was spreading and the scene met uh, the internet. There were two networks started back then, the Aminet, that was a network for Amiga uh, demos and other software and Hornet.org, that was an FTP for uh, PC demos. Well, Hornet.org is uh, not running anymore, but uh, we have plenty of FTPs to replace it, like, uh, for example, scene.org. Uh, Aminet is still working. And the demos has reached the point where harmony between code and design was reached. So it was not uh, about simply about design anymore, like for Melon Design, and was not about code, but uh, some very good demos uh, were released. One of the uh, good examples is uh, Nexus 7 by Andromeda, the winner of the party 94. And 94 was the acme of uh, the old uh, Amiga demo scene. For example, at the party, uh, the party 94, there was the most demos released at a single party, Amiga demos. 
Meanwhile, on the PC, the coder and the design demos uh, were crashing. <laughs> Again, there was a fight between these two styles. And the two very good examples for both are Dope and Stars, Wonders of the World. Uh, and these are also very good examples of how harmony was found between code and design. Uh, <coughs> usually, demos were favoring either code or design. And uh, that's the real difference between uh, Dope and Stars, Wonders of the World. Uh, you can read more about it in the second volume. It's still in the brewery. And this time, there was a mass migration from the Amiga to the PC, just like uh, people moved, out, uh, moved away from the Commodore 64 to the Amiga. Uh, here is a very good example uh, migrated, for a migrated group. CNCD released their demo inside on PC. It was uh, the third part of a demo trilogy, uh, close, uh, deeper, and inside, which was actually a very famous demo, but will soon return to it. The PC scene took over around 97 and 99. This was, a, uh, this was when the Amiga uh, was uh, really lagging behind the PC in technology, and also the production of the Amiga was already suspended. So people, people are just selling their Amiga and buying PCs, that's it. At this time, the Intel outside logo was appearing everywhere because uh, <coughs> some very fanatic Amigans were uh, trying to start a revolution against the PC, so to say, and they were bashing PCs at the parties, and uh, there were PC bashing videos everywhere, if you remember that. Well, uh, the PC now beats the Amiga in, in every aspect except reliability. But meanwhile, the demos were getting boring. Uh, both on the PC and the Amiga, with a few exceptions, there were just objects rotating on the middle of the screen. Uh, something new was needed. Something like Melon Design brought to the scene, but Melon Design was gone. Uh, what happened? There was first CNCD, uh, who were the forerunner of a new style. It is, uh, as you can see on the bottom picture, it's a picture uh, from inside. There were uh, pieces of graphics put over regular demo effects. It was not like Melon Design demos where there was only graphics and nothing else. Uh, there was code, there was very good code behind it, but design elements was appearing. And uh, as you can see on the top picture, that's from, uh, well, I think it's from, clo uh, yeah, it was re from Deep. Uh, colors were used very wisely. You know, it was desktop, their main designers, who came up with these color schemes, and he was doing a very good job. And they had the idea of demo remixes. Uh, this is a remix of Deep. It was titled Psilocybin Mix. The normal, regular demo was uh, recoded with different colors, different objects. It was resembling the old one, but it was not the same. And it had a much different music, uh, a very weird, uh, very progressive techno music. And uh, this also led to a uh, revolution in, uh, in music styles, because there were some experimental musicians appearing. There were York, Legan, Dune, and Muffler, and some of their followers, who started this uh, very interesting style that was uh, originated from uh, FX Twin and uh, uh, Kraftwerk and uh, other progressive techno musicians. Virtual Dreams, a very famous group, formerly a subgroup of Fairlight, also called uh, Virtual Dreams Fairlight or Fairlight, Fairlight Virtual Dreams, uh, has also uh, made its experiments in this field with its demo factory and uh, Sumer. You know, demo effects with some graphical, uh, graphical garnishment. Uh, the opposite side were coder demos. This is a very good example. This is artwork, a German group who are still sticking to the old 3D style uh, did in a very good uh, manner with a very, uh, very fabulous code, but it was, it was lacking design, and everybody was bored of the style after a while. So finally, uh, we reached Black Lotus, who were also masters of colors. On the top picture, you see a very good example of the, their design. It, it's, it's from Tint. And on the, back, the bottom picture, you see a screenshot from a famous PC demo. It is 303 by Acme. Uh, that was the first demo with uh, human vocals, in a way. Uh, at this time, uh, demo makers were experimenting with, uh, with colors, uh, combining as much colorful objects as they can with a wise color scheme designed by graphicians. <coughs> this was a transition to a new style. And then it came, oh yeah, meanwhile, uh, on the PC they started to use VESA true color mode. So there were true color demos, not only 256 color VGA demos. Uh, yeah, the Hungarian PC scene gets isolated. Yes, this was a very interesting uh, episode because the Hungarian PC scene has got into a state like the Polish, the, uh, Polish Amiga scene a few years earlier. So there were no contacts abroad. Nobody was calling foreign BBSs. There were no internet yet. And the uh, Hungarian groups were competing each other. 
like a very good example, but you can see there, Astraida and Shock, the two uh, fabulous Hungarian uh, demo groups. They were always uh, competing uh, at, at all Hungarian parties. There were many parties that time. Like in 96, we had around four, uh, 14 demos in a year, big parties. So some of them were over 1,000 visitors, all Hungarians. Uh, so the Hungarian scene was a little inbred and uh, a little isolated. The difference was that uh, while the Polish Amiga scene has finally opened the barriers and the Polish groups were going to foreign parties and uh, releasing demos for the wider audience, the Hungarian demo scene has, has uh, practically died from this uh, situation. So nowadays there are only a very few Hungarian groups. Uh, so to say there is only conspiracy you can name uh, for a really active Hungarian group. And uh, there hasn't been any, any great activity since like uh, year 2000 or something like that. So if we go on, yeah, new styles appeared around the year 2000 and the concept of the layer demo was born. What is a layer demo? Well, uh, it originates from the group How Job. Uh, well, there was a question often asked why How Job is called the same as a German rock band. Well, actually that has a story. Uh, Triple X of How Job has once told it to me, but he was very drunk and uh, later he told me not to tell it to anyone. Uh, <laughs> I will not, <laughs> it's not in the book, uh, but it's not accidentally called the same. So, uh, back to the layer demos, they, uh, they continued with the concept of CNCD, putting graphical objects on the, in the demo, but uh, not just that simple as CNCD did, they made a rich design, like you see there, it was the work of Visualize on the top picture. Uh, this demo is from My Kingdom, it's uh, from the party 97, the winner demo. Uh, the concept was uh, doing these rich graphics uh, with fragments of senseless text. You know, uh, at that time there was a trend of uh, demo lyrics. Uh, people were uh, putting poems and uh, messages in the demo that, uh, that uh, put some style uh, to it. But uh, what Howjob had was completely senseless, senseless text that created an atmosphere. And uh, the music was also following this trend because they, they mixed sound samples into the music that also uh, followed this uh, atmosphere. And finally, the demo had a feeling that cannot be reached with, uh, purely with the coders methods. And this was called layer demo because the, the graphics and the code and the stuff were put over each other like layers in Photoshop or uh, any composition programs. Uh, on, the, on the bottom picture, you see a very good example of uh, later layer demos. It is uh, Fate Fits Karma by Mad Wizards and Amiga P PC demo. As you can see, there are plenty of layers. For example, this uh, flower is rotating. This cube is just graphics. And uh, these uh, fragments of text, they are, they are completely senseless. You can put any text in a layer demo, like uh, an extract from a newspaper, uh, or you can, uh, usually they put uh, some samples from 50s or 60s American movies into the music that, uh, that gives it a very special touch. Uh, some people say uh, that these layer demos, especially how jobs demos, are all alike. Well, uh, in a manner they are, uh, but you have to watch all of these demos to uh, say it. Uh, how job demos are really uh, similar to each other because they were mostly designed by, by Visualize. Uh, and the same goes for Medvizar's demos because they are usually designed by Azaro and Kieru. Uh, but if you compare it to other layer demos, they are not really the same. Uh, meanwhile, on, P on the Amiga, there was a special new uh, style, which I called uh, cine demos, like cinematic demos. Uh, I don't know if this style has a name already. I haven't found any trace of it, but it's a special style that is, uh, you can only find on the Amiga computers. Uh, around 99 and, and 2000 were the first ones. On the top uh, picture, you see Rise. Uh, uh, if I, yeah, it's Rise by... Um, shit, I forgot. <laughs> You know, see, I'm getting tired. Hmm? No, it's not the RSI, it was a subgroup. Mm. Me mellow chips, yeah. Uh, there was those and Rise, the first uh, such demos. The, the concept of the scene demo is to display uh, cinematic uh, sequences made of demo effects with a small resolution, so it gets blurry. And you can do this on the um, uh, PC, because on the PC you have high resolution and 3D acceleration. And if you play the same 3D scenes on the PC, that would look very cheap. But on the Amiga, first, it's an Amiga. So uh, it looks very good on a, uh, that, uh, limited, uh, with a, a bit on a computer with limited abilities. Uh, but also because the, the Amiga uh, has a, because of its planar mode, the, the screen refreshing of the Amiga looks a bit different from the PC. Well, I can't, uh, 
I can't really show it here, but uh, if you watch an Amiga demo, you will have a certain feeling that the screen is, uh, is acting quite uh, different from a PC screen. It's the vibration or something like that, I can tell you. But it has to be an Amiga to display such cinematic sequences. On the bottom, you see a nerve axis demo. It is a relic. Uh, as you see, it is a, a city being destroyed by a firestorm. Uh, if you played it on the PC, it wouldn't look like as it does right here. But on the Amiga, it's hard to believe uh, that it's real time. And uh, the last, uh, well, I, I guess there will be more Cine demos in the future, but the last Cine demo was uh, released here in the assembly. It was Lapsus by Metafork. Whatever. <coughs> Let's go on. I'm getting tired like you, so <laughs> we are cutting it short. Uh, the new trend on the scene was the generated 64 kilobyte intros. It was started uh, by the Black Lotus on the PC with two intros, Jizz and Stash, in 96 and 97. Uh, for years, this concept was forgotten. What is this concept? They are not storing information for the intro, or as uh, little as possible. They are not storing 3D objects. They are not storing sound samples and stuff, but they just uh, write some code to generate them. If you generate a torus, for example, or a torus not a very di uh, difficult object, if you uh, store the, uh, the code that generates it, it will take just a kilobyte or even less. But if you store the object itself, it can, it can take uh, several kilobytes. And that's the concept behind it. So you can display much more with the generated intro. Nowadays, as you know, with, uh, for example, Fabra, which is making uh, such intros, or Conspiracy, and uh, the current concept is that they are not, not just coding these intros, but they are making demo, uh, intro making tools like Werzeug, as you know it, or Conspiracy's Addict, uh, Advanced, uh, advanced uh, Digital Dynamite Intro Creation Tool. That's it. They are uh, simple 3D programs and uh, animator programs where you can combine the effects with music and the uh, post-processing effects and stuff. Uh, Black Lotus is a very good example of the mixture of cine demos and conventional demos. Here you can see two of their masterpieces. You know, this year they have, they have won uh, the Breakpoint Amiga Intro competition for the fifth time in a row. On the first picture you see a screenshot from the Perfect Circle in 2001. On the second from Little Nell, 2003. Uh, they are also making cinematic uh, sequences, but not in the low resolution, like in the general cine demo. Uh, they more resemble a uh, regular demo. And they are still using uh, their old trick, uh, the very smart uh, color schemes that makes the entire demo uh, very lifelike, very, very unique. They are great artists, so to say. Meanwhile, on the Commodore 64, design demos were appearing. A design demo is not like a conventional 64 demo where you see the uh, effect on the uh, full screen with the logo and stuff, but they are more like uh, like this demo, this is 64 kilogram by Triad. They are more like video clips or modern PC demos, concept demos. Uh, on this picture, you see this uh, television guy. Uh, on his face, there is a very small uh, effect. And the star-like thing is rotating in the background. And on the bottom, there is a scroller. Now, this is, this is simple enough to easily code on a Commodore 64 and still very artistic. And today's demo scene, yeah. Today, demo scene is, as you know, most demos are built on 3D acceleration. The first 3D accelerated demo was probably coded by the Hungarian group Astral in 99, and in the demo coded Alpha. The, there was a special competition at uh, Contest 99, a big Hungarian party. It was called the Power Demo Competition. Nowadays, we would call it Accelerated Demo. And uh, this uh, proved to be the best entry. It had many sequels. It, there was Alpha 2 and Beta and many more Astra demos. Well, they are inactive these days, as far as I know. The gamer menace, yeah, this is a concern of the two-day demo scene. The stupid gamers were taking over parties. Yeah, it sounds funny, but it, actually it was a concern. You know, if you were at the party 97, it was a very big problem, because you went into that good old party place to meet friends and stuff, and all you could see was the 5,000 little kids shooting each other in Quake and playing Red Alert. And uh, I was there, and I was just... Hell, what's this? Uh, why have I traveled 2,000 kilometers for that? And it was very boring. It really broke the party mood. And, uh, you know, many people said it's, it's no concern. Why let them playing? Uh, so there were players, gamers at the parties before. But there is a difference between today's uh, gamers and, uh, 
and us back then in the early 90s because uh, everybody was doing something with the computer besides of playing back then. But nowadays gamers are not productive. And uh, so to say, we have to be straight, they are breaking the party mood if you're not doing something with them. Here at the assembly, they are handling them very smart with this uh, separation for the seniors. Uh, but at other parties where they didn't separate them, they broke the party. And the party is the best example. Uh, you know, uh, in 98, uh, there was a... Uh, you know, I was the main organizer of flag parties in Hungary. Uh, in February 98, uh, there was a second flag party. I just came, from, from the, came home from the party, and immediately I declared the rule that there is no gaming at the party. Uh, where it, uh, it uh, resulted in a heated debate in Hungary and disc magazines and stuff that uh, why Tomcat is banning the gamers from the party. It's gone stupid or something like that. But even some Hungarian parties were ruined later by gamers, like uh, Contest, which I mentioned, and the uh, Rage Scenest and the uh, Rageest, so to say. Maybe remember these great Hungarian parties. They were, they were literally ruined by these little kids. And uh, finally, at every party, there are regulations regarding gamers. Either they are banned out or seniors are separated from them. Well, uh, too bad they are more gamers nowadays than seniors. And today's scene is mostly consisting of old faces. And you can see a very nice picture here about the big bonfire at Breakpoint Party. Yeah, there are old faces around. Today's PC scene is mostly consisting of uh, the guys who started the entire thing on the Amiga or the 64. Uh, actually, there are only very few groups that were born on the PC uh, that are native PC groups. Most uh, famous PC groups are originated from the Amiga, so to say. And uh, today's trends are seeking barriers to breach. Right? It's very funny because the demo scene was always about breaking barriers. But nowadays, we have to find these barriers. On this picture, you see a very famous 64 kilobyte intro. It is Planet Potion. It's a PPC intro. Uh, a very good example of uh, looking for barriers is uh, the speech generation in intros. It appeared around 2002 when this uh, intro was released. No, 2003, sorry. So in 2003, everybody was trying to code uh, speech generators for their intros. And uh, nowadays, there are many organizations helping the scene. It's, you know, scene.org, Fusecon, Digital Culture, Demo Scene. Uh, by the way, if you want to support uh, scene.org, we have some scene.org t-shirts on sale for 10 euros. Uh, and the final question, which is, oh, you often ask, is the scene dead? The scene is dead, you say. Well, it is and it is not. Well, uh, there is a trend you can observe on, uh, on the today's PC scene. Around uh, 98 or 99 on the Amiga scene, uh, the smaller groups were disappearing from the Amiga. They were not going to the PC, usually. They were just disappearing. They gave up uh, computing. They gave up the Amiga. And only the best groups remained on the scene, like Black Lotus, uh, Ephedrena, and uh, I can tell a few names. Uh, back then, they said that the Amiga scene will eventually die out, but the best groups will keep on making demos. And there will always be Amiga demos, just like 64 demos. But uh, it will be a very small, however, very strong scene that survives. Now, if you look at the, uh, today's PC scene, what we see now, there are no newbies. There are no new groups. Even if there are some new groups coming, they have been uh, on the scene for years doing nothing. So you cannot find just very talented groups that appeared around 2003 or something like that, coming out from nothing. And the second very interesting thing that, uh, that mediocre groups are disappearing. So you see big elite groups that are making very good demos on international parties, but you don't see small groups that are making just uh, not so good demos, making just fun demos because they cannot do anything better, but they are aiming to make uh, something better later. Well, the end of the scene, well, on Amiga it started like this. The small groups disappeared and only the big groups remained. Uh, there is a trend on the PC scene. Maybe the same is happening. We'll see what happens in a few years, uh, and I don't want to predict anything. But I think the demo scene, as we know it, will eventually change to something. It will not die, because in every second year there is someone coming saying that the scene is dead. If you read old Commodore 64 disc magazines for like uh, 89 or something like that, they are already people crying about the death of the scene because uh, cracking is not that popular, for example. Or you can read about the death of the scene around 92 when the Aga chipset was released, the Amiga 1200 was released. They are crying because uh, this is a... Uh, too strong computer, there's, uh, there's no challenge to call the demo on, uh, on a new Amiga, uh, and so on. Even later, if you remember the PC scene, there was a, 
There was some debate of the, about the death of the scene where the first accelerated demos appeared. Nowadays, we have the same debate, and we will always have this. So the demo, demo scene might change, but it will never die out because the demo scene is not really about technology, but it's about friendship. It's a community, and communities don't die. So... <laughs> nah. Thank you. So now I think I'm tired enough. I will go to sleep. I'm out of pictures anyway. <laughs> Thank you. If you have questions regarding the book or all the bullshit I told here, want to tell I'm stupid or something like that, no one has questions. Well, okay, what? Future for what? Linux demos, uh, well, Linux is just like uh, the Atari ST, for example. There are demos made for it, but it's not the mainstream. And I guess it will never be the mainstream unless Linux takes over the Windows. So, oops. ST what? OpenG? Multi-platform demos. Uh, there were multi-platform demos. Time by time there were. For example, Complex had a project uh, to make a demo on all platforms, Amiga, Atari, uh, PC, whatever. And actually there are some groups who are porting their demos, like Astral, for example, was one of such groups. They were both coding for Amiga and Windows. But uh, all experiments to, uh, to port a demo to all platforms eventually fails. Uh, the big uh, demo that was... Uh, Complex's big demo that was supposed to be running on all computers was dope. The only the PC version was made. Uh, but if you go to Poet and uh, take a good look at the demos, you will see these little icons next to them for the platform. And, and many of them actually has uh, se several platforms. They're running, usually they're running both on uh, Linux and uh, Windows. Some of them also run on PPC and stuff like that. Yeah? Well, uh, the American uh, scene has never died out, actually, but uh, it never lived. <laughs> it was a very small scene. Uh, you know, it all started with, uh, around the ni uh, early 90s. There was a little Commodore 64 scene, demo scene. You can read it about uh, in the book. It was very small because everybody was caring about trading and making money uh, in a manner. Uh, people were not doing mail swapping because it was uh, more expensive than using BBSs. Uh, you know, in Europe, they're called American modern land, and, and uh, modern trading was considered lame. Uh, it was faster than mail shopping for sure, but it was considered lame because uh, it, uh, it had no personal connection between the, uh, the swapping partners. And uh, in America, they always uh, cared more about things that make you money. For example, on the BBSs. Uh, if you look at the American ANSI scene, it's uh, quite strong, but you cannot find people that are doing pixel graphics. It is because uh, people are thinking about ANSI graphics as a way to make money. They can sell ANSI graphics to BBSs. Uh, I mean, commercial BBSs. If you're a good ANSI artist, uh, you could find a job back then in the BBS era. But there is no use for pixel graphics, because who buys pixel graphics? Why would they download it? So there were a few guys who were making demos, very nice, you know, there are a few famous names, like uh, on the Commodore 64 there was uh, Havok or Venom, or the, on a PC there was Renaissance, uh, and other groves, there are not many American groves. That was very silent. UK. Uh, the British scene, you mean? Yeah, uh, there are very, very, good, very good English groups. We're going to put Nervex is, is an English group who uh, started this entire Cine demo thing with the, uh, I forget, Mellow Chips. Uh, they were English, and uh, there are some uh, good singers from the UK, like Statics, for example, the famous coder who called it uh, 3 and 3. There's nothing wrong with the UK scene. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it was never that strong as in some, for example, Scandinavian countries, but uh, I don't know if there is a special reason for that. For example, the Atari ST scene was particularly strong in the UK. So there was, uh, there was a group, for example, the Lost Boys, who, were, uh, who broke the, the domination of the Swedish groups, and they were the great opponent for Care Beers, who I've mentioned here. Uh, in, in every demo, in every uh, Lost Boys demo, there was a, some, uh, a teddy bear was destroyed in some way. It was crushed or punched or shot. And uh, yeah, they always bashed the Care Beers. And there was a very, gr very great group. Uh, you can read about them in the second volume, in the other parts.
No one. Oh. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the last. There is one more. <laughs> so. Yes, it's available now. Uh, if you come out right here to the right, there is the t-shirt booth. I'm selling very lovely t-shirts. You can buy t-shirts too. <laughs> Uh, there I'm selling the book, it's 25 euros. It's the first volume. The second volume is planned for next spring. Uh, surely we'll have it for the next assembly. It's, uh, the second volume is some, let's say it's some 60% finished. It, uh, the first contains the 64 and the Amiga scene history and the history of computer graphics and music. The second volume will contain the PC demo scene. Uh, and uh, the, in the second part, there will be one chapter for the smaller scenes, like the Macintosh, the Ottery, ST and Falcon together, and also Excel, uh, consoles, uh, Acorn, uh, Commodore Plus 4. You can sell a few consoles. That's it. What was there? Louder, please. I'm deaf. Uh, well, there is demo scene outside of uh, um, uh, Europe. The strongest is in Australia, especially when the Commodore, uh, Commodore 64 and Amiga scene was particularly strong in Australia. But uh, because of the distances, it was quite isolated. Uh, they were adapting European trends, but they were lagged behind. And uh, there were less demos made there, but there were plenty of disc Macs. Uh, I don't really know any activity in Africa, but there was some particularly strong cracker and uh, importer activity in the Arabic countries, like in Bahrain, for example, but uh, even in Iraq, before, before the Iraq-Iran war, yeah. There were some uh, importers in Iraq. And Kuwait, too, because uh, most, of the, most of Western computers were available in Kuwait. You know, it was a very rich country, just it is nowadays. And, uh, well, there were no serious demo-making activities there. But there were some. Oh, what happened? South America, yeah. Uh, there are some groups nowadays. Uh, well, I don't know, again, I don't know any serious activity there for years. But nowadays, there are plenty of South American seniors uh, writing on forums and stuff. There are some little parties, as far as I know, with not much demos or not too high quality demos. But uh, even back in the middle of the 90s, there were South American guys writing for uh, disc magazines, like Infobia, for example. There were some. That's all I know. You're welcome. OK, I think our time is up, right? Yeah, it's been a little bit longer than I expected, right? Ah, uh, well, shit happens. OK, thanks for your time. And <clears throat> for more bullshit, buy the book, and the next one comes next year. Thank you.